When no quarter came out and you went on the road, you were both careful not to commit yourselves to this project lasting any longer than what felt comfortable. Four years later, you're still together with a new record and a tour. At what point did you decide, this is going well? I think when we first, when we did the, the recording for the unleaded thing, I think it was mm. such an accomplishment. That, it, that alone was a success for us that we managed to pull it together and that it had gone well. Then actually taking it on the road, by the time we finished that tour, the spirit that we had, I mean, really, we'd like to have cut short part of that tour and maybe done an album then. I think that's yeah. true to say, isn't it? Yeah. There'd been a lot of stuff flying around between us and, and most of it coming from my adamance not to, to have anything to do with a Led Zeppelin sort of rerun if you like. I'd missed Jimmy's playing so much that as soon as we started working with the loops, I realised that I'd probably wasted quite a bit of time mm. because I really like the way that Jimmy attacks. Out of thin air, you get an idea which, is, which I, I, nobody else could ever possibly come up with. No matter who else it pleases or doesn't please, it pleased me no end, and I realised that uh, we got to sort everything out come clean if you like well i got to clean myself up in my attitude towards the future and any kind of led zepp remnants and really i was quite hypocritical because i was using zeppelin songs by then in my own set they always sounded like a kind of covers band in a way you know when i was playing them but now when we lean backwards as well as leaning forwards it's got new vitality i think working in that old room down in King's Cross, it really started sparkling again. Mm. We had to go through quite a bit of crap to get halfway through that world tour to really realise that, you know, we were really happening. And if we wanted to enjoy ourselves musically, we'd got to make sure that we really put our backs into what we were doing. No sort of... I'd seen so many artists from way back who <clears throat> worked together and, and the outcome is it's so pedestrian and almost just an excuse for leaving the house, that whatever we had to do had to be really very, very uh, positive and full of intention. You took no quarter out on the road. What was the experience different from when you went out on the road together in the late 70s? It's quite a production. I mean, by the time you get to Four Sticks and Kashmir in that show, we had to be really cooking because Jimmy was more or less leading the rhythms and the tempos and stuff and... And I was so excited with the working, firing backwards and forwards with the Egyptians all the time. Well, it's amazing sound, this great pad of the Western mm. Orchestra, this exotic, you know, the scales of the, of the Egyptians floating away on top. And then Robert steaming on, over the top of that was really quite something. But that was the standard. It was a high mm. standard to, that, that we had to go for, and, uh, well, we did it. I think if we'd have done it as a four-piece, we probably wouldn't have had... We probably wouldn't be here now, to be honest, because we really had to hone our personalities and our expectations to this sort of creature that we'd created, and we really had to get it together. There was no slouching, no, this was no sort of rerun of old glory. This was a, a new thing, despite the being the majority of old songs. It was so exciting, and a, a dream come true, which neither of us could have actually created without the other. We had to be together to do it. I mean, if you think about it, all the years that you've, you... You're lucky to have a talent to even get away with making records in the first place, and when you take it to such an extreme, it was fantastic. The Eagles were out at the same time with the Hell Freezes Over tour, and obviously they were emulating their hits, and they were, they were playing... Their musicianship was spot on, you know, and they, they must have settled their differences and goodness knows what, but what we were doing was so rivetingly exciting that some nights the thing would just sh it would just go off somewhere that we never expected and it was wonderful it was much more than a comeback sort of thing hey the boys are back you know it was all that crap it was a, a real dream come true hard to beat were you worried that your public would not accept this new dimension this new direction in your live work well, the the very first the the very first gig was Pensacola, and I must say I was really nervous because even though we'd we'd said before I'd said before that it was a great success for us, there was still the fact that we hadn't played it in front of a, a proper audience that were paying for tickets to go in, and there was always a possibility that you know they might not like it. It might just the sound of having an orchestra and 
<coughs> Western Orchestra and the and, and Egyptians on top might just be so alien to there is. We thought it was totally seductive. In fact, the reception was so warm and, and gratifying and exhilarating that it was wonderful. It just went on from there, obviously, all the way through. Success breeds its own, you know, problems which we all know about, um, both psychologically um, and ambitiously, because uh, there was, there's still, uh, I suppose, in certain parts of the world, the desire for us to be exactly as we were in 1970, mm. and that for Stairway to Heaven to be the ultimate finale and all that sort of thing, which, um, you know, uh, it happens to everybody from Jerry Lee Lewis through to, I don't know, Mark Allman. You've got to do some of those songs or whatever. But the thing is um, that we were able to tackle that problem and still stretch and expand. And anybody who was around when we were putting out records as part of Led Zeppelin would know that whatever the next move would be would be different to the previous one. Mm. And I think, really, as we've come off that whole sort of no-quarter thing into this, we were determined that we'd have to be very strident and very, you know, there was no sort of half measures. We've got to make, we've got to write a selection of songs that really said, you know, we mean business for ourselves primarily. Whether it touches anybody's soul at all is neither here nor there. Tell us about the new album, Walking Into Clarksdale. Let's start with Most High. Well, Most High actually went to a number of permutations using the original rhythm track. To um, originally, it was more. more Ed, Ed Shermer had some lush keyboards on it, and we d decided one day to change the, the approach. And a guitar riff went on it that had never existed before on it, and it was stripped down to just the the, the, the rhythm section and, and the guitar. And we bought in um, um, Tim from Transglobal Underground, who, who who was playing keyboard on it. And magnificently, I might add. So where it almost sounds like it's Rater Pipes or, or, or whatever, it's in mm. fact him. But he's a master of an oriental keyboard. At the end of it, we tied in a little of, uh, of Ed Strings and mm. tied it them up. So in fact, that was something that totally went round in all manner of permutations and transitions to what turned up at the end. But it was well, probably a good idea of how many of the songs came to be anyway, that they were, that worked and reworked. Was the writing of any of the songs spontaneous? Uh, heart in Your Hand, Burning Up, House of Love, When the World Was Young, Shining in the Light. I think the Sons of Freedom. Was Sons of Freedom, yeah. yeah. Walking into Clarksdale was pretty spontaneous. Um, yeah, but it, but it was it was revisited. It was yeah. like some, for instance, Burning Up is like that's a performance track. Mm. That's one guitar all the way through, for instance, and and it's one take. Mm. Uh, so that, that's what we'll call a performance one, whereas we, with Clarkstow we had the arrangement, but we revisited it and changed yeah. textures on it and things, you know. But there was no great deliberation. It was like, yeah, that's good, uh, but we need a bit more power here and there, and that's on the revisiting side of it. I should say that uh, over 50% of the stuff was as we first played it, Yeah. after half an hour of messing about in a rehearsal room. That was it. And we didn't want to play them again. So don't play that anymore. Because if you play it again, we're going to, by the time we come to record it, we're going to... Those little nuance areas, mm. like in When the World Was Young, we didn't play it for months. We just wanted to leave it alone. So when we finally did play it, we'd have that, that sort of tentative, shaky, sort of not quite sure, but woo atmosphere, mm. which comes out on the, on the track. At what point did lyrics present themselves? Some at the very beginning and some with a great deal of effort. And some from the Dylan school of lyric writing. Last minute as you sing in the song. <laughs> if, just, if I'm missing a line or two, uh, I usually get it once I'm in the middle of a performance and I just carry my pencil and uh, reading glasses. Terrible, isn't it, really? <laughs> once upon a time it was just some old blues standard and I had to pencil and reading glasses. You are both fans of music. Do you find what you are currently listening to may be inspiring the music you make yourself? I've always have tried not to, to be that influenced by what is going on a around me, but it probably might do, mm. but I consciously don't try to, to emulate something. Although, obviously, with something like Burning Up, you can tell the end of that comes from a definite period, but a lot of the rest of it, I've tried not to make it like, you know, anything else, really. 
It probably is. Yeah, I get emotionally uh, attached, I, I guess, to the same periods always. Mm. We were talking about Jeff Buckley, but I've, I was listening to Tim Buckley quite a lot. And I've spent a lot of time listening to uh, the various forms of Arthur Lee's love and uh, all the things that... I remember writing a letter of support for, for love in 1970 or 69 in the Melody Maker Letters. You know, and I'm still... In parts of me, there is, I'm still really inspired by those great moments of, of invention and, uh, and I can't call them sincerity, but the sort of naive wonder of, you know, the castle and the Capo and all that sort of thing, the, and the arpeggio guitars and the, the whole vibe that was around them makes me think, uh, you know, it's my, one of my favourite and most influential periods, I think. You know, as much as I like Cold Sweat and, you know, the James Brown period and stuff like that, that's more syncopated, punctuated. It doesn't have that sort of um, early Buffalo Springfield feel or whatever it is, you know, or whatever's come since that's tried to latch on to that. Um, yeah, so, it's, it's so all for me, part, yeah. It's all part of your roots, isn't that's it? Right. That's your musical heritage and your roots. doesn't mean to say that you've necessarily studied it and tried to play it. Oh, no, no. No, but it's all in there and it weaves yeah. itself around and can come through. And, uh, and you go, mm, yeah, that is a bit like, so, you know, that style of, of music or whatever. Tell us about the contribution of other musicians on the album. Charlie Jones and Michael Lee, it's, it's such a good rhythm section and obviously have got better and better since. I mean, they, they, I don't know how long they were working with you in the previous days, how many years it was, but mm. certainly over the years that we've just been through, you know, they, they really click in. That you can come up with an idea and they really lock in fast, which really helps yeah. things along. Sure, they come up with ideas, you know. Yeah, Charlie's uh, been quite, uh, yeah, very uh, quite formative. Things like um, Blue Train, the bass bass lines, which actually do sometimes steer the song or create or or suggest a mood. Mm. But I mean, when you're sitting down in between, when you're messing around, people just keep playing odd bits and pieces. And Michael is so flexible. I mean, when I first met him, he'd been working with Lenny Kravitz and, and he had that kind of skip beat drum style, the whole sort of flavour of the month yeah. type drumming. But the thing is that he could turn himself to jazz, big band, 60s, double snare, gah, 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 yeah. and he had, he had it all covered so naturally. So if Jimmy started playing like on uh, When I Was a Child, that great mood guitar, you don't have to say a word. The whole thing just fits in mm. instantly and and Michael immediately takes it into somewhere beyond lounge drumming this beautiful sort of empathy which is really fantastic There's, you can't say enough good about those guys question nine do you find it a challenge to keep up with innovations of recording or is it a relief that you can get effects now quite easily which 20 years ago might have presented unsurpassable problems well, I think the greatest problem with uh, with a band that's playing organically and playing sort of honest tapes is to is to have somebody who can actually record it. And that's why we've been so fortunate mm. to be working with Steve Albini mm. because, you know, he really knows how to EQ using microphones, which is uh, which was the old science of mm. recording, and he understands that and knows it fully, totally versed on it, and and that's really helped with the uh, with the recording process. And plus, it's been wonderful working here. EMI in that, that great room down there because everything sounded so good mm. as well. Many people were surprised when they heard that you were working with Steve, Steve Albini that there may have been two different cultures clashing. Well, I don't think it is two different cultures clashing because the music that he's been associated with, apart from Nirvana and Bush, has been quite an eclectic bunch of you know, outfits out of Chicago, Scotland, the auteurs or whomever it may be, but always people who were like <clears throat> trying to push the edge of the boundaries of music, stretching it out a bit. I and think the that's... guitar bass bands as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, guitar bass yeah. bands. And, yeah. I, and I mean, the work he did with Big Black and Rape Man and stuff like that was stuff that we were buying mm. at the time in Zepp. So, I mean, it was parallel lines. The only thing is that I suppose the more renowned we became or the more successful our songs became the less testy we were supposed to be but that what i don't think that's really ever been the case we haven't ever rushed out either now or in zeppelin days to 
to get nice and chummy for radio or whatever it is. So I think that the, there are a lot of parallel lines and a lot of uh, similar appreciations of music where we we sort of melded straight away. Mm. And um, I, th- I think even more so because um, Steve's a guitarist and, you know, he gets on well, likes what Jimmy does. And the fact that Jimmy doesn't sort of ponce up the guitar, you know, I mean, Jimmy's sounds on this record are like there's a lot of attack in there. Mm. They're the right sounds for the right moods, and Steve mm. got that down with the microphones, and Jimmy got it down with the guitar. So I think it's a, I yeah. don't think it's an unusual combination at all. I suppose because of Albini's always been outspoken and didn't ever want to get in. I mean, he didn't really want to do Simply Red, but it was a good it's a good combination. It seems very natural to me. Yeah, I mean, historically like, and practically. Yeah, Albini is clearly a man with a reputation and very strong ideas, all of his own. Was there a risk that he might impose his own agenda upon you? Yeah, I think so, but I think that's a good thing. I mean, I've had some struggles with him uh, about vocal sounds and stuff like that. But I think that's good. But that's only because you know what you want to get. It's like with the guitar, some of the things he might not have known what I was going for at all to begin with, but then he goes, oh, yeah, I can see what that's all about, you know. So really that's because we really knew what we were doing, all of us, in our own way. You know, Robert knew how he was getting his mm. vocal approaches together. I knew what I was doing with the guitar textures, and Steve knew how to get it together on the, uh, on the tape. He's inc- incredibly professional and, oh, yeah. in, and amazingly uh, historically versed in, in, in the music that we love. I don't know all the Boston underground bands that came out of the, the demise of the Del Fuegos, you know, but I mean, I do know that we, we do meet the three of us in many, many similar little sort of pockets of musical appreciation, which meant that we could use points of reference when we, I said, well, look, I feel this song needs to sound a bit like the mood of a certain song, and he'd, he'd catch it. He's, he claims that he produces nothing. He's, he moves the mics around and he records it. He said to us, he said... If musicians write the song, it's done, you know. Uh, We didn't move any choruses around or middle eights particularly or anything like that. But I did say to him, look, you've got to give me an idea of whether this vocal's working or not, because he was going, yep, okay, that's good. Do you want to move on? And I was going, well, yeah, but tell me, is it any good? You know, tell me what I'm doing here. And so he became more involved in performance, because in the beginning he said, how do you think I feel telling you that I think that line's shit, you know, or that or you're a bit flat on that note there. He said, imagine me telling Jimmy Page that that, that solo wasn't as good as he can do. <laughs> so that was very sweet of him. <clears throat> but even if he didn't tell us, he was obviously thinking, that shit or that's great or whatever it is. But the thing is, we've got really high standards anyway. I think that's what really comes into it, mm. of ourselves, what we expect of ourselves. Is there any way that you have been influenced or intrigued by drum and bass? Well, definitely excited by it, absolutely. And especially the fact that um, there's loads of those sort of funk James Brown, neo-James Brown rhythms that have been sped up. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there have been various radio stations in London over the past 18 months that have concentrated on that as a music form, and it's been really exciting. I mean, and... Because I don't live in London, I, um, when I, as soon as I get within the confines of London, within 30 miles, I just start searching the dial because there's new radio stations every day cropping up. And also the dub stations, mm. you know, sort of Barrington Levy into Infinity. Great stuff. Yeah, and also I, th- I think um, when Jimmy was talking about working with Tim from Transglobal Underground, the whole Asian dub scene and the uh, outcasts, the Thursday night in Notting Hill Gate, you know, the sort of meld of contemporary Asian artists with drum and bass and with various sort of contemporary dance rhythms, which will be in a year's time obsolete, but for now, you know, it's incredibly exciting. Some of it works amazingly well. The Doll Foundation, you know, the Sikh drummers? Oh, amazing. (laughs) We went to see Natasha Atlas with uh, Transglobal Underground, and uh, the Dole Foundation opened the show, and it's uh, 15 Sikhs come on stage with the huge Dole drums and the big beaters, dressed in, in full Sikh party regalia, and the leader goes up to the microphone and just says, 
hold on to your trousers. And then this <laughs> rhythm comes, which sounds like an Alan Lomax field recording yeah. from uh, the 40s, from down in uh, Parchman Farm. I've got all the, the drum and fife stuff from northern Mississippi that uh, Robert Palmer was recording. Mm. And it's uh, so amazing, absolutely amazing. I really wanted to use them on this record because... It's like some of the stuff that Bonzo used to do, kind of poor Tom rhythms mm. and uh, Bronner Eye Stomp, mm. is just the beginning of it. But it was really tantalizing, so good. And then there's still the old um, early ska and reggae stuff that you can get at Gazzy's Rockin' Blues at the Sam Maritz on a Thursday night in Water Street. I mean, there's some great little enclaves. And down in Momo's in Hedden Street, in the bar down there, there's all the kind of contemporary rye stuff set to dance grooves, which is... And, and some old Egyptian Um Kalsum string parts, which are thrown across amazing drum and bass rhythms, mm. which somehow leave Britpop a little bit lacking in imagination, you know. Do you believe that you have a peer group? I don't know. I mean, I think that, um, that Bob Dylan, I think he really worked hard with... Daniel Lenoir to make um, a pretty upstanding record recently. Mm. The success of it, uh, artistically, aesthetically, commercially, is not the point. The point is that there was a lot of effort to make um, a testy record where he was. Uh, you can't live up to your own reputation because the work that he did way, way back was sociolog sociologically crucial as well as, you know, uh, musically satisfying for us all. Uh, I think he did try hard, and I think so did Lenoir, to make to create a mood, which I respect. The Stones, I don't really know too much about them, except for they just go on and on and on, you know. I mean, uh, it's a kind of comfortable organisation. They are the Rolling Stones. There are other ways that we could do this, you know. Maybe we could have been Led Zeppelin. But as far as peers go, I mean, most of the people that are from our generation, have kind of changed tack a little bit. And um, their presentation musically is, and, uh, and maybe artistically, is, is not quite as um, challenging maybe as it was. And I don't know how, whether or not they get the same amount of satisfaction consequently. But, and I think that as you get older, you know, you can't keep grabbing a young, virile audience forever and ever and ever but it, but i think there is a for the general listener i think there's a threshold age-wise where people get to a certain point and then music loses to a lot of people the kind of the passion and the the importance in in one's life that it used to the position it used to hold uh, it hasn't for us and i think that it's it, it, the proof is in the this collection of songs